he was dangerous and I hated him. He's coming into the house. God This is Jackson County 911 emergency. Yes, I need somebody out here right away and I need an ambulance. Are you in danger? Yes. I remember her screaming, die, die, while he was bleeding out. She played the lead role in a horror movie. Wonder why she was so good at the role. On July 26, 2016, Oregon police receive a panicked 911 call reporting a shooting. This is Jackson County 911 emergency. I didn't see anything. All I can tell you is a gun went off. Where's the patient? Laying at the front door on the ground. Is the patient alive? I don't know. I'm not going out there. 63-year-old Shane Moore is lying shot on the floor, fighting for his life. I started hearing yelling and screaming, and I walked out. All I knew is that my sweet friend was laying there. It didn't even register in my mind that he'd been shot. Not immediately. In the midst of the chaos, Carlton Olson, Shane's friend, grabs the phone and agrees to follow the operator's step-by-step -step instructions for CPR. Unfortunately, when the first responders arrive at the scene, Shane is already dead. The EMS had pronounced Shane uh, deceased at the scene. At the moment, Detectives have no clue what happened at the family's property. As they go through the scene, they look into Shane's wound. It was probably like six inches below his head, right in the sternum area. It was a perfect circle, like right, right through the center of his chest. While detectives wait for the search warrant for the house, the notary who called 911, Carla, gives them some details about the shooting. What Carla told us during the interview was that she had received a, a call from Shane Moore to come up to the residence and get a quick claim deed signed, splitting the property 50-50 between he and Kelly. The entire time from the time that door shut, everything was just off. Carla, who was called to do a signing, remembers seeing Shane approaching the outside window, emerging from behind the house. Suddenly, Shane's niece, Tucker, who had been nearly invisible, unexpectedly showed up. Tucker came up and there was a towel on the table and she had reached underneath the towel and when she brought it back this way, in my head I went, oh my God, that's a 38. But Carla wasn't prepared for what was going to happen next. I heard the gunshot and I was like, what just happened? And then I hear him yell, you shot me. And uh, I was like, oh my God, oh my God, I don't know what to do here. So I was scared to death. When she found out what had just happened, Carla called 911 to inform them about the shooting. Subsequently, she left the property in fear of her life. She really needed to leave, like, immediately, and that's the reason why she passed the phone off to just anybody that could take it during the 911 call and got out of there. Carla tells detectives that Shane and his sister, Kelly, had a fight. Following this, Kelly and her daughter, Tucker, are taken to the police station for further interrogation. We know there's a past established it. A lot led you to where we're at today, but we got to have it from you. You were there, I wasn't. As Kelly and Tucker start talking with the detectives, they portray Shane as a troublemaker. There's a big barn back here. His marijuana growing is here. There's a meat locker downstairs where I have every reason to believe that he's making methamphetamine. Kelly shares that she and her daughter Tucker were staying at the ranch with her mother because of her brother's aggression in the past. She tells the detectives about the incident that happened nine months earlier, involving Shane and Tucker. September of 2015, Shane was getting ready to leave the residence and Tucker said something. I think she cursed at him or something similar to that. After the verbal exchange, Shane threw a heavy object at Tucker, which hit her in the head, causing her to fall to the ground immediately knocked her down to the floor it hit her so hard could have taken out her eye but it hit her on the cheekbones split open her skin she's permanently scarred from it and she called the police shane was charged with assault and tucker got a legal no contact order to make sure shane stayed away from her however kelly said this didn't stop shane and he kept making their lives a living hell he has for the last nine months been threatening us directly on the phone that he was gonna kill us. 
If Tucker didn't take, drop the charges, Tucker didn't drop the charges, he's gonna kill us. She continues by telling detectives that Shane got in an aggressive mood hours before the shooting when he heard their mother decided to sell the family ranch. My mother decided she wants to sell. And Shane looked at me and he said, don't you f up my deal, Kelly. Don't you f up my deal. Or you and Tucker, and he made a gesture across his throat. This is confirmed by a realtor who told the detectives over the phone of the incident. When I went towards the house, he said he was going to f up my truck. And he says, and I'm going to kill you and Tucker. And she, um, she said that he said that to Kelly. He, he said that to Kelly. After Shane calmed down, Kelly told her daughter to come out. And I told my daughter to come out because I'm frightened. I'm really frightened. I'm screaming, Tucker, where are you? Come, come. After the realtor left the property, the notary Carla came, and that's when the chaos began. So I took that opportunity to look at the document. And Shane was outside to the sliding glass doors looking in. Upon discovering that Shane had instructed the notary to draft a grant deed, ensuring the property would be divided equally between them rather than through a will, Kelly became absolutely angry. And I said, oh no, my mother is not signing this. This is her property. She's not signing this. And I ripped it into four pieces. And I'm trying to shut the door and he's shoving it into me, shoving it into me. And I'm, and I'm leaning forward trying to shut the door. And he, he was trying to come in and he was try, trying to hurt me. And, and God only knows what else he was going to do. When asked if she shot him, or whether she knows who did, she claims she can't remember. Did you shoot him? I, d I, d I don't think so. I don't know. You don't think so? You don't know? I can hardly remember. The trauma of that moment was so appalling and horrifying. I didn't know what Shane was going to do. I didn't know what Shane was going to do. It was horrifying. After telling detectives all the details up to this point, she suddenly changes her behavior and tells detectives she doesn't want to talk anymore. That's the end of my statement. You don't want to tell us what happened after that? No, I don't. Following Kelly's sudden change, detectives decide to focus on Tucker. They hope they'll get to know who shot Shane. She didn't like being pressed for specific information. If it was broad, she would answer it, no problem. Um, but the details are where she would get hinked up a little bit and not want to answer. However, after being pressed for some time, Tucker finally starts telling the story of the events that led to the shooting. I found a gun um, that I believed belonged to my grandfather. Uh, I wanted to know if it was loaded. I took it outside onto the porch and I fired it. That was this morning. The story matches the 911 call Shane made that morning expressing his concern that something would happen. Dispatch, this is Shelly. Hi, I'm with your, uh, I was hoping I could get a sheriff out here. I'm expecting a notary public to be here at, at, at 2 o'clock to 2.30. And I don't want any trouble with my sister's over in the house. She, she, uh, her kid fired off a gun over there this morning. I'm afraid my sister's going to try to stop the notary public, and that's what I'm afraid of, and I don't want any, I don't want any trouble. Unfortunately, we don't get involved in civil cases. That's not our job. And so for those reasons, we don't go out there. Following the test shooting, Tucker remembers handing the gun to her mother. When she showed it to her, her mother suggested placing it somewhere accessible. They covered it with a towel just in case they would need it. She then remembers the chaos that ensued after her mother tore apart the papers for the grant deed. Everybody was screaming from what I can remember. And um, Shane started opening the door and entering the, the house. Okay and he was banging the door into my mother, and my mother was screaming, and he was screaming. In that moment, Tucker says she grabbed the gun. She says that she had a feeling Shane was going to hurt either her or her mother. Even earlier that day, Shane made a threat to kill them if they ruined his plans. She described him pushing the door to the residence with his shoulder and reaching around the back of the door, like from a horror movie. Following this, the gun went off, and Shane fell to the ground. I don't even remember what happened. It was like screaming, and I thought that you had to cock a gun for it to go off. And um, it was. Did the gun go off? Yes. <laughs> I didn't mean to shoot the gun. 
Though Tucker insists she acted in self-defense, the detectives choose to file charges. Quickly, she is charged with manslaughter. The following morning, Tucker is released on bail, and investigators arrive at the ranch with a search warrant in hand. As they go through the scene and recover the murder weapon, detectives find something strange. So you open the cylinder, and it showed that one round had been fired. So what that means, if the same gun had been fired earlier in the day, which Tucker had told us that it was the same gun, somebody had had to taken the time to pull that spent casing out from the earlier firing and reload it so it's ready with a full cylinder of rounds for later on. So it was a premeditated. Suddenly, Tucker's story of self-defense becomes less certain. There's a real question about whether it was truly self-defense or if something more troubling is at play. The situation leaves a lot of room for doubt. He was not armed. He didn't have anything on him. Just flip-flops, jeans, uh -huh. and a t-shirt. On the other hand, Shane and Kelly's mother, Lori, claims Shane was the aggressor. Shane lunged for the gun that Tucker was holding. Shane's own mother, Lori Moore, told us on the phone it was Shane's fault that Tucker shot him. Even when I knew that he was dead, I, I was just relieved. I felt relieved to know that he was dead and would not be able to threaten and frighten me anymore. After five days with no solid clues, on August 1st, the detectives finally get a promising lead. Shane's roommate, Stacy McKenzie, reaches out to them with information that could reveal Shane's side of the story. When she arrives at the station, Stacy reveals that it was Shane who feared for his life that day. They were not afraid. They were not afraid of Shane at all. Shane was afraid of them. Shane actually told me the day that he died, he goes, I'm afraid for my life, Stacy. because I'm afraid that somebody's gonna kill me. One of them are going to kill me. Shane and Kelly's brother and sister-in-law, Ryan and Rhonda Moore, also claim Shane was the good guy, ready to help others in need. A good guy. I, I personally think he was the kindest, nicest person in our family after my dad. Shane would fix their cars. He would go over to the Jacksonville house and re make repairs. Shane and Kelly were always fighting, usually about money. Kelly is the greediest person that I know, that I've ever known in my whole life. They used to fight like cats and dogs, horribly. Money, always money. His sister always had this dire need for lots and lots of money, and she would take whatever she could get from anybody. Stacy shares that Shane resolved to leave Kelly and the ranch the moment the mother passed away. He was aiming to avoid any future conflicts over the will. To ensure this, he asked his mother to settle everything immediately. If she died, Shane planned to cash in the quick claim deed, collect his money, and walk away without any issues. His mother agreed to sign it that day. However, when Kelly found out about this, she became furious. They thought it was a will. So she comes back to the table and she grabs the paper that was to my left with my stuff. And she goes, that's a grant deed. I was told it was a will. She's not signing it. So she rips it up. When Shane's roommate Stacy heard the screaming, she went over to their house, where she saw something she hoped would never happen. I was yelling and screaming at Tucker. I was screaming at her to get the hell away from him. Because she was standing over the top of him with the gun in her hand. And she was yelling at him, just die. The next thing I heard was Kelly screaming out the door, what do you mean he's not dead yet? However, detectives still think they don't have enough evidence to charge Tucker with manslaughter. After six months of slow progress in the case, the detectives receive an unexpected lead from Tucker herself. It turns out there is a video recorded on her cell phone from the day of the event. Tucker's lawyer argues that the footage shows Tucker defending herself. However, the detectives think otherwise. This was a very different set of circumstances than, than we were told during the initial interview with Tucker. Yes, this man, this man, this woman's life, my mother, unless she signed that paper. Unless my mother signed it. This is up to you. She's narrating, she's saying, I see this man, Shane, he's aggressive and dangerous. He's coming into the house. God damn it. You're she has a gun. She's not signing a grant deed, Shane. I thought it was a will. She's not signing a grant deed. Yeah. You son of a bitch. She's not signing a grant deed. It's her property. Yeah, if you, if you told her Jesus! 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 Oh, God. She shot Oh, God. Oh, God. 
it proved the exact opposite of what they were claiming. It proved no self-defense and exactly what happened at the front door. After viewing the startling cell phone video capturing Shane Moore's death, the Jackson County Police are now prepared to accuse Shane's niece, Tucker Moore Reed, of first-degree murder. On September 4th, 2018, Jackson County investigators take 28-year-old Tucker Moore Reed into custody once more, this time escalating the charges against her from manslaughter to murder in connection with the 2016 shooting of her uncle, Shane Moore. Following this, they are contacted by a local filmmaker named Matthew Spickard. He shares with them that during the time Tucker was out on bail last year, she acted in one of his movies. She's accused of shooting and killing her uncle. And in a creepy twist, she was arrested after filming a horror movie about a woman who shoots a man to death. I'm Valerie, I don't know if you remember my name. She was such a phenomenal actor, it was just insane. We, we absolutely adored her. She definitely seemed to, to really nail it. I was very impressed with her. We were like, oh yes, we have this wonderful, talented girl who's gonna really take our movie to this next level. Tucker introduced herself under the stage name Wynn Reed. In the movie, her character shoots someone. Investigators find this a bit strange. The scene is her holding up a cell phone for a flashlight and a gun, you know, and then the guy comes out basically from this doorway of this other room trying to like talk her down and say, you know, give me the gun. And she just out of her fear of the whole situation, shoots him. Basically, when she shoots this character, she absolutely believes she's doing it out of self-defense because of the situation. This scene very much represents the incident she had with her uncle. He played the lead role in a horror movie. Wonder why she was so good at the role. After some time in custody in January 2019, Tucker requests a hearing to find out if the judge will allow her to post bail, giving her a chance to leave jail while awaiting her trial. The hearing unfolds much like a trial, with evidence presented and witnesses taking the stand. The video Tucker recorded also plays. After the shooting, Tucker left her phone on the table, but the audio still kept recording. He's not dead. No, he's not dead. <laughs> Subsequently, Kelly is asked to describe the events that led to the shooting. He was mostly saying, um, this is my property, you better not up my deal with, with mother, Kelly, you better not up my deal with mother. I, I was afraid. <laughs> I was more afraid than I've ever been. And I wanted Tucker to come outside with the gun. I wanted to have the gun, I was that afraid. Finally, after a thorough hearing, the judge is ready to make a decision about whether Tucker can bail out. And I do think the state has established enough evidence that gets him to the standard necessary to not grant bail. As the judge announces the decision, Tucker's emotions spiral out of control. She starts to cry uncontrollably. Her breathing becomes rapid and erratic. Even after she is led out of the courtroom, her desperate cries can be heard. And you can't help but to think, is that just another act as well, you know? It wasn't going her way, so let's try to make it another act. Let's try to shift it. By May 2020, almost four years after the tragic incident, 30-year-old Tucker comes to an agreement with the prosecutors. Tucker is sentenced to 75 months in prison as part of a plea deal related to a second-degree manslaughter charge. This agreement includes credit for the time she has already served. The DAs were under the assumption that there would at least be one juror every single time that would would vote not guilty, possibly deciding this sounds like it was self-defense. I was just floored when I gave her six years. It's nowhere near enough. Tucker is currently situated at the Coffee Creek Correctional Facility in Wilsonville, Oregon. Her earliest release date is November 25th, 2024. Finally, Shane's friend, Stacy, reflects on the whole incident. There's a lot that I never was able to understand. I've never known anybody to be so loving and caring and giving as Shane and to be treated the way that he was by his own family. I just don't know, just greed.